All right, so um, today what I'm gonna uh, take you through is uh, some torturous thinking that I've been going through, and um, most of it is probably lies, a lot like this thing I'm showing you here, here. but it's to give you a feel of uh, probably some important concepts that we'll be able to do fun things with. Okay, so where, this is the outline of the talk, and basically, I want you to take home this idea that there are these things called viral information and um, how I arrived at this uh, thinking. And the reason that I'm really interested in this right now is because viruses are uh, winning the game of life, okay? And this is something that we all know about. So you guys all know these numbers, that there's more of them than everything else and that most of the genetic diversity is there. And even the difference between everybody sitting in this uh, audience is essentially just your viral component, okay? And in the end, you're all going to end up feeding the phage, right? So that's where it's all going. So why is this and how come they've been able to do this? Now, I think one of the main things that's been problematic is that we can't see them, right? So everybody uh, that goes out and does ecology and evolution does not get to see viruses, and they weren't incorporated into the things. That's what your glasses are actually for. Um, if you look at those lights up there, you can actually see the viruses, and I got those for the coral reef field because they're so confused you can't even believe it. But what makes it even more fun is that if you put this on, you can actually put it on a laser pointer, and when you go home, you can uh, show everybody the viruses. So let's think about this. So why are these guys winning, okay, and what's unusual about them? And I think it's, uh, this is a starting point. Okay? When a cell divides, okay, everything in the cell, um, right at the first, at the division step right here, everything that was in the mother cell is in the two daughter cells, right? They're 100% the same. And then as you travel through time, you'll grow, you'll divide again. And there's going to be this mixing of matter as you go through time and space. Viruses do things differently, okay? And what they do is they only pass information from, in, from one uh, generation to the other. So you have the virus go in, uh, it shits its DNA in, and nothing that was in the capsid or in this sequence has to be in the next generation. And that's kind of cool because you can do things like what, uh, which was first done in viruses, but now of course it's done repeatedly in, uh, in bacteria too, uh, humans can do it, is that you can take, you can sequence that guy, turn it to electrons, send that over the internet as photons, resynthesize it as DNA, and get back the virus. Okay? So the only thing passing from generation to generation is the information about the, uh, the virus itself. All right, so what is information? And this gets tricky. The information that I'm gonna to talk to you is, I'm gonna call it physical information at the beginning, okay? And this is literally just about position of where you are in the universe, okay? It's a very weird concept, okay? So if you sample the universe, okay, and you go out in space, mostly what you're going to find is nothing. Every once in a while, you'll pick up a proton, or, right? Eventually, you'll get a photon. You'll see things of that nature, okay? And every once in a while, you'll find something big like a helium atom. And eventually, you end up to something like the sun and Earth. It's very surprising. It's very unusual to find those things. And that's what we mean, actually, by information. That's what people are talking about. Okay? And I'm going to use a very old example to illustrate this. And this is just Boltzmann's uh, uh, distribution of particles in a, uh, in a uh, box. So imagine there are all these things bouncing around in there. Okay? And what you have is the average energy, and which is your temperature, and then you get this distribution of different things with different velocities. Okay? And as you change the temperature, you get things, uh, things that are more things that are at the higher temperatures. What that's important for, if you're going to uh, bring this up into chemistry, is that as things move in this direction, this is how you increase the energy of activation. So these are the guys that are available to do a chemical reaction, right? So we're gonna stay at the physics level, but the, remember this is the chemical part of it. Okay? And this is what's going on whenever you do a reaction. So you have a distribution of some uh, set of molecules that are vibrating, 
And some of these guys have the potential to hold, to interact with these, and this is what sets up a dynamic equilibrium. Okay. All right. Now, we have to remember a thing called Maxwell's demon. Okay. So this was a challenge to, to the second law of thermodynamics put forward by Maxwell. Okay. And the pro idea here is that you would actually have this uh, hypothetical entity that could pick your hot molecules and move them into another room. Okay? And this is how you would build a perpetual motion machine where the hot molecules would be on this side and then you could drive a little engine going the other direction. Everybody remember this? I hope. Okay. So this is uh, the, a, just a theoretical concept. And why this is important and where, where I'm going with it for this is that there's actually a thermodynamic uh, cost to this. Okay? The reason that Maxwell's demon, the reason we don't have perpetual motion machines is because of actually this gain in information about the position of these A molecules over here. Okay? So when the demon, this idea of a demon, does this reaction, it actually is picking these things up and it's changed the relative position of, of these molecules in the universe which gives you back a, uh, it constrains where it can be. That's really information. And if it goes backwards right here, there's a thermodynamic cost. And this thermodynamic cost is design, is uh, quantified by something called Landauer's principle. And it's a very simple relationship here where basically it just says, if I put this piece back into this distribution, right, I'm gonna change the pressure that's one way of thinking that which would bring up uh, the temperature again. Okay. And this is the cost right here. It's about uh, at room temperature three times 10 to the minus 21 joules, which is almost nothing. But it really matters if you do a lot of it. This is actually one of the main reasons your computer gets hot when you're working on it. So here's the hypothesis and how this goes with the viruses. Since viruses are this information that I was telling you about earlier, okay, you actually have to, uh, you have to pay a cost to erase information by Landauer's principle. So imagine that you have something like this. A virus, it goes through a replication event and, it, and it, a mutation is introduced. Okay. This is a change in the amount of information associated with this population. That looks thermodynamically free, you won't notice it. But when you go and you erase this information here versus this population here, so you just, over time, it degrades away, you're going to pay this extra uh, three to six times 10 to three joules, okay? Very small amounts of energy again. Okay. All right, except when we go in the environment, we notice things like complete conservation of sequences across the whole planet, okay? And what this is, is that if you go, so if you go by specific PCR, and you take and you start looking for specific genes across like uh, hot springs and the ocean and sediments and so forth, uh, sea ice, you will find exactly the same gene, right? And we have no evolutionary theory that actually will explain why we would see this. We don't see anything in the wobble, nothing of that nature. You can see it genomically. Hatful's group has seen this a number of times where they get exactly the same piece in very, very disparate genes. And you see it all the time in metagenomes where different viruses have exactly the same sequence, even if they're from completely different environments that have been uh, separated in time and space for a long time. Okay? All right, so if you extrapolate the uh, uh, um, how many genes we think, uh, how large these populations are by these counts, we think that the global population sizes of these uh, genes are something like 10 to the 23rd. So there's literally a mole's worth of a particular sequence out there, and that sequence is maintained absolutely. So what does that mean? So as you're going through this thing here, so you go through a replication event, and you do this uh, with a population of 10 to the 23rd, okay? And you just assume one mutation per replication event, and let's say half-life of a week. Over the course of a year, it's going to cost 
uh, about one time, I sorry, uh, a thousand uh, and one thousand eight hundred more joules to have this going on than to have this. Right? So this population is actually energetically more efficient, right? And if we could see it and if we could measure it, this will outcompete this one, given a limited amount of energy. So the hypothesis is, is that the Landauer's limit is the smallest force of selection because it's really only about this relative position of atoms in the universe. Okay? And that because of it, we can actually, because of their information only lifestyle, we can actually notice this in the viruses where we wouldn't be able to uh, do this in the lab, mostly because these are extremely large numbers. So we really don't have some place where we can raise uh, 10 to the 23rd uh, phages. Yeah. So if this limit is the very bottom of this, why do we actually have so many viruses at the top part? Okay, okay so now I'm going to introduce something that I'll call viral information. And for all in particular, uh, for all intents and purposes, we're just going to start out with something that we're going to call genetic. Okay, so we talked about physical and how that could be this connection between that and, the, and a DNA sequence. Okay. Viral information is something else, because this is a piece of information that actively converts itself into uh, other pieces of information into itself. It's invasive, that means it goes in, like a virus will go into a cell and turn the cell into viruses. It's xenotrophic, so it's eating other, piece, uh, other types of information. And it reduces thermodynamic efficiency, and I'll show you why I think this is true. We know that this is true, so this is just recent, uh, really, where people have really gotten into how physical information uh, can be used to do work. And this is just a series of different experiments um, showing where the Landauer limit is, uh, driving a, a micro machine using information, and actually using demons to, uh, to trap a molecule and make it walk upstairs. So biology has, of course, been doing this forever because all we do in biology is we just set up these demons, like this sort of thing here, and we use those demons, right, to grab and resort the universe. Again, we're back to the same thing. You've got A here. The demon is going to be picking up the, the ones with the uh, extra energy, whatever that happens to be. They move it into... Uh, they trap it by combining it with B, and you end with AB. And then as it degrades, you would see the release of heat is what we're going to argue, at least in this case. Okay? So the way that you measure information, I think, um, or that we can uh, uh, classically do it, is by looking at the destruction of it. It's much easier to look at what's going on here and as it degrades back to here. And that's what calorimetry does. So we're going to try, there's two types of calorimetry um, that really matter. Isothermal is what tells you about the rates at which this is happening, and then bomb calorimetry tells you how much order you have in this part of it, okay? And we're going to be using isothermal, okay? So here are the two, uh, these relationships between uh, physical and genetic information, at least in my brain at the moment, okay? So, Physical information in cells. This is what we're talking about. This is how much order we put into the universe and it's associated with a cell. And we're gonna be able to measure this with calorimetry. Along this line, we have genetic information, which is what's contained in the metagenomes. So this is how, what are the positions and what genes are they encoding and so forth. Okay. This is essentially, for all intents and purposes, this would be ecology and this would be evolution going along here. You can imagine that if ecologists are correct and cells are only neutrally doing a job, right, so it doesn't matter what cell you have, you can have positions where you take a species A and you just let it run with a certain amount of energy and it's going to run up and it'll end up up here. It doesn't matter what the, the uh, organism is or anything, it's still gonna do basically the same amount of work, okay? And this would be a neutral model, and this is basically most of the ecology models like uh, metabolic theory of ecology or something of that nature. 
Genetic information, though, is different, right? Because what it's actually trying to do is it's trying to get more of its stuff over here, right? So it's trying to gain more energy and bring it over in this direction. And we can measure that with metagenomes nowadays. Now, if you're above or below this unity line, you should be able to see the behavior of a system. And the way we're going to do this is using calorimetry. So in this experiment, what we have is uh, you have a calorimeter where what you've got is right here a vial. And in this, you're going to put just the food. So this is, in this case, just seawater where we filtered out both the viruses and the bacteria. And they're sitting here. And then on this side, you're going to take the food plus an inoculum of the bacteria. Okay? And then you're going to measure the heat difference between these two uh, vials. Okay? And over time, what you see is how much heat is released. And when you do that, you get uh, a certain rate, and that I'll use in just a second. The other thing that we want to do now is we want to add the viruses to the system. So we're going to take, and we're going to take the food in this case. So now we only have dissolved organic matter. We're going to either add the inoculum, uh, we're going to add the inoculum to everything, and then we're going to either add a viral concentrate to one side or a killed viral concentrate to the other side. And not surprisingly, what you see is when you add the viruses so they can kill the bacteria, you actually get more, uh, uh, I, sorry, fewer bacteria in that, in that vial, and you get more microbes on this side. That tells you that you've got some top-down behavior. What's interesting is that you actually get more heat production out of the system. So even though you have fewer cells here, you're getting actually more use of all of the dissolved organic matter. So you've used up more of that information that was in uh, your dissolved organic matter. To give you a fill, it's something like about uh, half a joule per uh, 20 mils over 36 hours. This many joules in the world's oceans every year, which is equivalent to all of the fossil fuels we have on the planet. So this is a big process out there. And if you put it on this thing that I was showing you before, so here is your calorimetry uh, results in nanojoules. Okay? And then across here, again, it's genetic information associated with this. These dots right here are the individual uh, experiments um, where we, to calculate the amount of information associated with the cells. And you can see that um, uh, what happens is that this is without viruses, and this is with viruses. You see the per cell, the amount of energy associated with the cells goes down, okay? and that you get this increase in viral information going this direction. Okay? So this is, I think, what we're looking for, and we're actually doing a whole bunch of experiments now where we're coupling uh, different types of calorimetry with the types of uh, the different types of viruses, uh, sorry, the metagenomes at this point. Okay. For the ecologists in this room, it probably looks something like an intermediate disturbance hypothesis. Okay, so what it looks like to me you've got is in these systems, um, the virus or the, the cells, when you first inoculate them, they've escaped their viral predators and they can just run up um, towards maximal entropy. But when they have the viruses there, what happens is that they get knocked down at some point and they end up somewhere closer to a climax community. Okay? So this would be one application of this sort of uh, thinking. We'll see if it works out. Okay. So hopefully, uh, I probably just confused you, but <laughs> hopefully uh, I showed you how there can be a connection between physical information, which is basically put there by gravity and organization of the universe, um, versus, and how that can be connected up through biology into this ultimate version of it, which is what I'm going to call viral information. And with that, I'm going to thank my co-author, Katie uh, Barat, who did lots of the uh, thinking about this and actual uh, calculations with me. And then, of course, poor Anka and the math guys who have to listen to this stuff all the time, and then the artists that helped uh, uh, come up with illustrations of it. And I'm done.
plenty of time for questions. Thanks, Forrest. That's a lot to think about. I have one question and then uh, maybe a second question. Okay. So, so when um, information is coded, how do you think of the? If you had a, is it is it being coded at the single instance of a genome, or only if a change is fixed within a population, right? So, so how sh if let's say I have a, you know, a, a marine virus, and one of the bases changes in one instance of that virus in one yeah. particle, does that count, or is it only if that thing undergoes selection and is fixed within a population? Yeah, so it has to be, so that's that, that really hard thing. So there's not, you know, everybody has this sweep idea going on, but that doesn't really, I think, work. I think what happens is that it's actually in that little bit of water, that little population is actually in competition with each other you know, those, those entities okay. right there. So that's all happening right at that point. Even though we, the only way we're ever going to see it is like at a large scale. Okay, got it. it. Does the, that make the, sense? The, the okay. So let me, the single particle is in competition with heat death. Yeah. Right, yeah. with not existing. All right, then the second, the second question is, have you thought at all about reversible computing? So the idea that if you could understand the sort of energetic path of a process well enough, you could design a machine that would change state in such a way that there's negligible heat loss, right? Yeah. And, and you could therefore go backwards, right? And, and yeah. if so, um, although humans have not yet engineered reversible computers, maybe evolution has selected for them, so is that out there? Yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's brilliant. That's actually what I'm really uh, interested in, is how do you, how has biology uh, tweaked these games, that just like in the reversible computing example, but even the, uh, you've probably seen uh, where you can use entanglement to get rid of the information. And have you seen these? Uh, it's cool. Never mind. <laughs> so yes, I could. You could really imagine how they're uh, they're changing. Biology could be playing all these games that we would like to play, but they're already doing it. We've just not thought about it. Yeah. And it may be that there's so many of them that we can observe it in the in the virus fraction. No, it's only by it's only in against the second law locally. That's always been what people that even in reversible computing, right? It's you're paying a heat cost to the universe elsewhere, always. I, even this is like what uh, Villarreal. I can never say his name. That that's what his stuff is about. Um, I don't think you ever not pay the heat cost, but maybe not. <laughs> Uh, Forrest, um, you've reduced things to information, which is fine. I, I can I can be happy with that. But the but those damn phages, in, in addition to the information, they also sometimes bring material from the previous generation to the next one. Yeah. And uh, so it's not only information, but al also real stuff. Right. Yeah. So I'm not. I mean, I'm completely aware. It's just that. Only theoretically do we, they, they're doing it different than cells, right? So it's, uh, I, I realize that it's not exactly perfectly that way, but they seem to be, have tied into this idea that's much more of a human, that's what we do, right? We move ideas around in a way that uh, doesn't require a physical exchange of anything, okay? They're much closer than a cell ever can be. Good? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> Copy? Yeah. I think we can uh, take these remaining questions over coffee. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody.